Hello, everyone, and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're watching this in the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to see so many of you tuned in. Uh, this is part four of our owner series. In the first part, we discussed the buying of super yachts. Uh, in the second, we talked charter. In the third, we talked refit. And today, we're offering a bit of inspiration in these troubled times as we talk to two owners who have done truly extraordinary things in their boats. This is going to be very special indeed. But first, uh, introductions. My name is Stuart Campbell. I am the Editor-in-Chief of Boat International, and I am delighted to be here hosting this session, which forms part of our ongoing virtual boat show. Uh, we have some fantastic exhibitors, so please go and check them out. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention uh, our brand new Boat Briefing podcast, which launched today. The first one features an interview with tennis superstar Rafael Nadal, who recently took delivery of a brand new Sunreef AT motor catamaran. He's a very happy fella. Uh, just search for Boat International on Spotify or Apple, Apple Podcasts uh, to download that and have a listen. Right, before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. Today's session will be recorded uh, and available later in the week on demand. So don't worry if you have to leave early. The first three parts are also available to view now at the Virtual Boat Show. Uh, meanwhile, if you would like to tweet about the event, please use the hashtag boat owners. Uh, you can see it on your screen now. Importantly, we will have time at the end of the session for your questions. You're able to submit them uh, throughout the conversation uh, whenever you're inspired to. At the bottom of your screen is a chat button. Simply click on that and submit a question. The team behind the scenes will pass these on to me and we will do our very best to get to as many as we possibly can at the end of the session. If you're having trouble viewing the live stream, please email events at boatinternationalmedia.com or message the team through the chat feature. Uh, my email is about to appear on screen. This is the last session in the current run of the owner series, but please do get in touch if you'd like to see any other topics discussed by Supio owners. Uh, drop me a line, feel free. It's no problem at all. Right, let's meet our experts. Jan Erik Osterland is the former owner of the 54.6 metre sailing yacht Adele, built at Vitters and custom designed to sail uh, amazing blue water passages. Adele is one of the world's most beautiful yachts, a catch with lines uh, by world renowned studio Hope Design. Jan Erik is also a World Soup Yacht Awards judge of long standing, so knows a thing or two about quality yachts. He joins us today from his beautiful home in Devon. Anil Tadani is the owner of 45 metre yacht Latitude and is also a World Super Yacht Awards judge. Anil has become one of the most recognisable faces on the super yachting scene uh, due to some of the incredible passage making he's done on his boat, including two transits of the Northwest Passage and the circumnavigation of Svalbard. Anil joins us today from Singapore. Uh, Anil, thank you very much for staying up so late for us. Uh, we'll run this session a little bit differently to previous ones. We'll start with Jan Eric, who'll talk us through his adventures, after which Anil will discuss uh, the things, some of the incredible things he's done on board Latitude. I will then have some questions for our guests, after which we'll open the floor to questions. So please do send any through that you'd like answered. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the mic uh, to Jan Eric <coughs> to tell us a bit about Adele and the incredible adventures he had on board, on board her. Thank you, Stuart, uh, for that. Uh, I, uh, before I had Adele, I've been sailing on uh, another yacht, Swedish Caprice. You can shift picture. Uh, and Swedish Caprice was a 79-foot yacht, which I had for more than 15 years. We did a couple of sailings around the world, but we also did some uh, interesting crossings. We went from uh, Japan to uh, Alaska, and we did a crossing from New Zealand to Tahiti. So we didn't only go west, but also east. Based on the experiences of Adele, I built, uh, sorry, of Swedish Caprice, I built Adele, and uh, Adele is 180 foot, but the length belies uh, a little bit the size because she is very slim. So, uh, and she has low freeboards and she is a catch. The reason for the catch is that we wanted a large sail area 
as you can see, she's carrying 3,000 square meters of sail here. But we wanted that and still be able to go under the bridge of uh, the Americas in the Panama Canal. And that limits the height to 62 meters, and we are just below that. So we can do a crossing. And if you shift image, you can see that when we reef uh, the catch and all sails are either furled for the two foresails or reef for the main and mizzen, uh, we still keep the sail balance. And I will talk more about that in a later picture. It's not only the sails, but also the deck and interior, which are important to consider. And it's very modern now to have a large deck area and large saloons if you have a large yacht. But you have to be careful uh, because you need to be supported in high winds when the boat is going one way and another. And as you can see here, walking down into the saloon, you can grab a handrail and the backrest of a sofa actually supports you. And also all corners are rounded. You can look at the table and you can look at uh, the bookshelves here. It's important too, if you have a yacht with many guests, that you don't know only have one big area but you have several smaller ones where you can sit down and relax and talk, not all, with all guests together, but that you have a chance to withdraw. Here I am in the aft cabin of Adele and uh, with my wife. And uh, we had three deck houses on Adele, so the crew had its own deck house where they could relax a little. And all of that is quite important. Let's shift to the next slide, please. Uh, with Swedish Caprice, I did a lot of worldwide cruising, but it was two areas I didn't dare to go to, and that were the polar regions. So with Adele, we decided to first go north and into the pack ice, and then uh, here you can see the Smerenburg Glacier. And then we, can you go back to the, uh, no, back, please. Uh, yeah, uh, we went uh, uh, then south and through the Panama Canal and sailed westwards via Galapagos and all the South Pacific Islands to Vanuatu. And there we turned south to Auckland and around Cape Horn. And from Ushuaia, we went south to Antarctica until the pack ice made it too difficult for us to continue. And then we turned north to the Falkland Islands and South Georgia and Brazil. And we finished our two year voyage in the Caribbean. Now you can shift, please. And you saw this already. Notice the way we are dressed. I choose this picture because it explains a little that you have to be equipped for the cold weather, even if it was the summer in Svalbard. Now you can shift, please. A couple of wildlife pictures. These are walruses. And uh, you see on the next image, you see the polar bear who is trying to walk. And uh, uh, the sea is splashing the polar bear. He was walking, or she was walking with two cubs uh, that followed her. And if you shift image again, the next amazing thing in this region is that the pack ice was just north of Suverna, an island group just north of Svalbard. And we came up into a pack ice and you we could actually have walked from here to the North Pole if we have had the equipment for it. And if you shift image, we see that, that two of our tenders, I would say to any sailor who want to do long distance voyaging, uh, bring as many tenders as you can. We have 10 uh, people in the owner's party, uh, my wife and I, plus four guest staterooms. So we were normally 10. Uh, and you need, with a couple of crew, at least two tenders to get out. But on top of that, we wanted to leave one tender for uh, the crew. So we had 
three tenders on board, two of them stored on either side of a forward deck house that you see there, and a third stored forward of the mast in a special well for that tender. And if you shift, uh, we have moved very far south to Galapagos Islands at the equator. We have gone through the Panama Canal. And you have two sea iguanas flanking my wife. And the amazing thing about the wildlife is that none of the animals are really afraid of you. From Galapagos, we went to Tuamotos, and we are at the Makemo Atoll. And uh, it's two things, really, which are necessary to navigate um, uh, uh, here in coral reefs. And the first, which is unique for a sailing yacht, of course, is that we can get far up. And we had a crow's nest that we could hoist it hydraulically up to 40 meters up. And you can see that you are absolutely sure here that no coral uh, reef is nearby. And the other thing you need is a tender. And here, this image is taken with a crow's nest about 10 meters up, not 40, but 10 meters up. And that's enough to spot the coral reef very clearly. And you can even see the passageway that you go through, uh, uh, have to go through, and you can direct the captain very easily. And uh, let's shift again. Uh, the other uh, area, apart from coral, where the crow's nest is absolutely necessary if you have a chance to have one, that's of course when you are in pack ice or ice flows and you risk to hit a bird unless you spot it from far up. And if you shift the image again, you can see that the crow's nest is uh, traveling uh, uh, along the mast up to 40 meters. You can sit on two seats on it or you stand up. And if you sit down, you are very protected, uh, as you can see. The red color in the background is actually our spinnaker, which is hoisted there. So if you, uh, we have now moved far west to the, uh, as far west we went in the South Pacific. We are in Vanuatu, and this is the island of Tanna. Uh, Tanna has a volcano which explodes and uh, spews out lava blocks every five minutes, roughly. And the first image showed the volcano during daytime. And here you see the same explosion. It's a two second exposure. So each of the trails you see is one lava block, uh, the distance it travels during two seconds. Most of the blocks fall back into the crater again, but some ends up on the rim, still glowing. And that's the spots that you see. And remember that this is about 100 meters across. So it's a wide distance that I'm photographing. From Tanna, we went to Auckland and did some maintenance on the yacht after a year of sailing. And then we continued around Cape Horn. And the last um, week, we had hurricane winds all the time. And uh, we was still very stable. And the reason for that was that we had we were sailing with just the staysail reefed or furled rather, and the mizzen, which was also reefed to half a size. So instead of the 3,000 square meters that you saw on downwind sailing in the beginning, we are here carrying about 200 square meters, which was enough to drive us uh, forward for, uh, with a lot more than 10 knots and still be very safe and stable in hurricane winds for more than a week. And we have come to Antarctica. And again, we have the same experience as is in Galapagos Islands. The animals are very curious and not afraid at all. This is a chin strap penguin looking at my wife, Jennifer. But the most amazing was not the chin strap penguins. It was the humpback whales and we had many visits of whales, and especially the humpbacks were enormously curious. And this guy stayed with us for 90 minutes, and he not only showed his back, but his belly, and uh, we, you could really bend down and tickle him. 
and he pushed Vedjot uh, Adele very gently, but he had red marks over his nose afterwards from the bottom paint. And it, it was lovely experience, as you can see, all of us crew and guests are leaning over and saying hello to him. The other thing, again, that's of course the eyes. And the icebergs, many of them have these vertical sides because they have broken off a glacier and they break in vertical sides, really. But sometimes there are smaller flows as well. And here you can see Adele going uh, through some of the ice and to the right behind the stern of Adele and a little bit towards us are a couple of seeds. Uh, they are very friendly and sweet, but there are a variety which is more dangerous and that's the leopard seeds. And here I'm trying to photograph a leopard seal and um, we are just north of Le Maire Channel. The next uh, image shows one of the amazing icebergs we met and we were just traveling into it as far as we dared go with a bar and as usual I'm up in the crow's nest with my camera trying to catch some images. South of Le Maire Channel uh, we came into more and more ice and it became more difficult to navigate so we decided to turn north to the Falklands and from the Falklands we came to South Georgia and if you should take a look, yeah, here we have Prion Island and Prion Islands, uh, uh, a lot of albatrosses are nesting. And this is a courtship ritual between two albatrosses. They do that for several years before they decide to marry, if I may use that word. So they meet uh, here on Prion Island and they come back the next year and meet again and go through this courtship ritual. Ritual. And when they uh, mate, they mate for life in many cases. The other birds that are amazing are, of course, the king penguins. And here we see a field of them, actually about a quarter of a million of king penguins on South Georgia on Salisbury uh, Plains. Uh, and uh, they are very curious individuals, as you have seen with uh, um, uh, uh, other animals, the chinstrap penguins and the humpback whales. I had a telephoto lens on one of my cameras and I photographed them, but I had to put it down and pick up the wide angle lens and camera instead. And two of the king penguins decided that my tele lens was very interesting and I still have a bite marks on the lens hood from their curiosity. And I could tell you many more images but I stop here to give a word to Anil and uh, I do it with this image from the Caribbean where Adele is sailing away. Thank you. Thank you Jan Eric. And for, for everyone watching I just want to point out that yeah that was a truly heroic effort to fit so much into uh, 15 minutes. We had we're on a fairly sh strict time schedule but uh, Jan Eric uh, has you know, hundreds, tens of thousands of photos. And uh, as you can see, many of them very, very beautiful. That's just a tiny selection of the of the uh, photo archive um, that Jan Eric has. Um, thank you very much, Jan Eric. That was fantastic. Um, Anil, over to you. So rather than it being a single journey, your adventures have taken place over a few years and have gone a few different places. So perhaps you can tell everyone yeah. watching, this is just three seasons. Can you just tell everyone watching what you did in those three seasons? Yes, so the, so the first, um, that's a hard act to follow, Jan Eric. Yeah, that was amazing, that story <laughs> that you told. Um, and uh, now I'm thinking about all the pictures that I have and I'm going to go back and do what you just did. But uh, so but I bought the boat in 2014 in January and uh, that very summer uh, in uh, July, we set out from Florida and that's the green line. So those those dates are just backwards. The, the green is actually 2014. We went up the coast of uh, the United States, the East Coast, through New Newfoundland and to the uh, what is it, the southern tip of uh, of Greenland, the southwest tip of Greenland. 
went up the coast of Greenland, which is absolutely stunning. We stopped at places like Nook and Ilulisat. And for those of you who have the opportunity to do that, Ilulisat is the closest thing to heaven on earth. Uh, from there, we crossed across the Davis Strait and entered the Northwest Passage. We, the, the, the first person to successfully navigate the Northwest Passage was a Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen, who did it in um, 1905, I think it is. So we tried to follow his route almost, uh, uh, it took the exact route that he took. And uh, interestingly, because we followed his route, so we, that you see the green line going all the way across Alaska, down British Columbia, and we ended the journey four months later in San Francisco. But uh, there was an interesting thing that happened uh, because of this journey. That first year, there was an enormous amount of ice and there were many occasions on which we um, thought we might have to turn back. We wouldn't make it, but we pressed on. But because of the ice, we had to make a detour. Uh, I can't show you on the map there, but uh, just before Cambridge Bay, we had to make a detour around an island. And we happened to arrive at a spot where after uh, what was uh, the Franklin expedition was 1845. The two boats, Erebus and Terror, that sunk during the Franklin expedition, they've been looking for them since 1845. And they found them in that spot, in that detour we made on the day that we were there. That was the day they found the Erebus. So when we arrived in Cambridge Bay, the newspapers were full of headlines about the Erebus had been found and we had actually just come from there. So we were so fascinated by this Northwest Passage that after wintering in San Francisco, the next year, next year, summer, we decided to do the same thing in the reverse direction. So that's the blue line that starts out in San Francisco. We spent about a month exploring Alaska, photographing grizzly bears and all kinds of stuff. Uh, moose and grizzly bear. And then we did the Northwest Passage in the reverse direction, exactly what we had done before. But we skipped Ilulisat because our first journey to Ilulisat was uh, quite hairy from the point of view of the ice. And nobody was uh, had the appetite to do that again. So we went down to the tip of Greenland, but then we went around the tip of Greenland and up the East Coast, which is even more beautiful than the West Coast, the East Coast of uh, Greenland is really, um, I mean, it's, it's I, I, yeah, I, I wish I could show you some pictures. It's magical. And from there, we went to Iceland, spent a month in Iceland, down to Dublin, and we wintered in London. The third year, 2016, we started out in London, went to the Baltic Sea, went to Denmark, Sweden, did the Swedish archipelago. And then we did a wonderful trip up the west coast of Norway, and when we got to the top of Norway, a place called Tromso, we went straight up north, stopped at a place called Bear Island, which you can't even see on the map. It's so small, but there were no bears there, but it's called Bear Island. And then up to Svalbard. And uh, we then circumnavigated Svalbard. The highlight of the circumnavigation was a detour we made right on the top. That little white dot you see east of the north part of Svalbard is a thing called Kvitoya. It's, a, it's an island made of ice. And it's where walrus mothers go to have their babies. And you are not, nobody is allowed to go there. But fortunately, David Attenborough, who I'm sure some of you know, or most of you know, I've heard of, had a permit to go there to film this uh, walrus uh, and their babies. And the guide that we had had been David Attenborough's guide. So the license was actually in his name. So he was able to take us there and, and keep make sure that we didn't do any damage. And we loved it so much, we spent four days there. And uh, we thought we'd never get out of there because we got stuck in a lot of ice there. But it was absolutely the highlight of the trip. So that's the three trips we made. And then, of course, we've done others in the, in the Pacific. So these are just a few of the pictures um, party on, on the sun deck. The, one of the days when we had amazing weather, we decided to have a barbecue on deck. The guns that you see us carrying were, were a mandatory part of the equipment. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police stopped us in Halifax and said, 
we had to buy guns and take them with us. Fortunately, we never fired a single shot. But every time you got off the boat, you had to have three people carrying guns because of the accidents they've had with polar bears, who obviously are uh, the poor things are there. Their, their whole habitat is, is endangered. And so they are becoming very aggressive. They don't have enough food. The polar bears feed on seals and they can only hunt seals on ice. Um, and uh, this polar bear that you see on the, in the left top of this picture actually surprised us. You can't see it, but the, the, the terrain go is very steep on the other side. So he came up a slope. This was in near Quitoya, actually, that island I mentioned. And he was hunting walrus and walrus babies because the full-grown walruses are difficult for them to hunt. And we were setting up a barbecue and he popped up over the horizon. And needless to say, we had to pack our barbecue and get the hell out of there as quickly as we could because these guys are extremely dangerous. Uh, the picture on the right is latitude at the highest point we had ever reached, about 82 degrees north. Uh, the picture below that is all of us hiking on that ice island. We, we went up to the northernmost northern, northern point we could go, and we got off and did that posed picture on an ice flow. Not recommended to anybody to ever try that, because that what you don't see in the picture is we had three people around that flow with guns waiting in case some of the bears decided but this is exactly where the bears hunt is on these flows so this is not recommended but we really wanted the shot and so we did it so that was the 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 trips around the arctic the following year uh, the boat went from florida down to new zealand and then from new zealand we did a journey traveling north through uh, solomon islands the Vanuatu over the top of Australia and between Australia and Papua New Guinea into the Indonesian archipelago, which is truly one of the great ocean conservation areas on this planet. It's absolutely beautiful. This is that the last bit of the, the line on the left. I think we have some pictures, uh, Stuart, of those. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's me with uh, some village kids in um, Vanuatu. They, they were, they were, the people were extremely friendly, I have to say. And uh, you can see my teeth a little red because uh, I tried chewing some of that beetle nut that uh, the locals chew to get high when they're bored. And um, it is, it is uh, pretty uh, potent, that stuff. That island on the bottom left was an amazing uh, configuration. And the only reason we even found out that it looked like that was because luckily we had a drone or two on board. But otherwise, if we were anchored, where we were anchored, all we could see was that bit of beach in front of us. But when I put the drone up, I realized the incredible topography of this island. So we got on, our, on the tender and uh, we went actually in there. And uh, it was a really quite an experience. That's a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Yeah, that was our, our trip through the Indonesian archipelago when we went looking for Komodo dragons. You know, Komodo dragons are the last remaining a sort of um, ancestor of the uh, dinosaurs. They are just large lizards, but they're extremely dangerous and very toxic. Again, something that is not recommended. I got into a lot of trouble with the rangers for taking that picture. And uh, they kept warning me about how many people these, these, uh, these dragons kill every year. And I joked and told them, don't worry, they, they don't really like Indian food, so I was safe. Um, the diving in that part of the world is absolutely spectacular. As you can see, the, I'm, I'm diving there next to a turtle. But what you have to notice is the clarity of the water. The water is like that everywhere. You have 50 to 100 meter visibility underwater. Absolutely extraordinary. And in the bottom left of the Komodo is the island of Komodo, which is different from the other parts of the archipelago in that it, it does not have a tropical rainforest or the green trees growing on it, they're all like that. They're sort of brown grass growing on them. And they're quite spectacular in their own way. The beaches are unbelievable. Pink and white coral sand. Yeah, that was also, uh, this was a trip that we did in the Helmahera Sea, which is, again, as I mentioned to you, is uh, from, um, we went from Manado to the, uh, to the uh, Raja Ampat area basically diving all along the way. There's not much else to see. 
the only other thing that I got to see on this trip was the uh, very elusive and very difficult to find bird of paradise. And it was really an experience to see that. We had to get up at four o'clock in the morning, take a dinghy in the pitch of black night and hike up at a 60 degree slope up the jungle to find this one tree where the bird of paradise comes at the first light of day. When the sun first comes up, these birds come to this one tree and this local guide we had knew where this tree was. And we stood under that tree for about four and a half hours before this damn bird showed up. But I managed to get a really good shot of this bird and um, they're quite difficult. So these are these are some of the areas we passed uh, in the Indonesian archipelago. The one on the left is uh, an area called Misul, south of Raja Ampat, which is, uh, as you can see, that speaks for itself. You have these sandbanks in the middle of the ocean. So in high tide, it looks like that. It looks like a path through the water. In low tide, it's a vast expanse of beach. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, for those of you who like any kind of exploration, cruising with, uh, with scuba diving thrown in, there is no better place. So that's me with, a, with an ocean, ocean uh, manta ray. These things have, uh, you know, four meter wingspan. But the most interesting thing was the top, top right corner is a creature called a wabigong. It's a wabigong shark. It's of the shark family, but a totally prehistoric creature, a stealth predator. They camouflage themselves into the sand. And when some the hapless prey go by, they just open the mouth and swallow him with a, with a very large suction uh, movement. From the, They swallow water with such force that whoever is swimming in front of them just gets sucked right into them. And they don't hunt any other way. They're purely stealth predic predators. Uh, one of the people that were with us tried to get very close with a GoPro camera to get a close-up of his mouth, and he took the camera from him. And he, uh, my friend, my friend just managed to get his hand out of the way in time, but lost the GoPro. Probably gave the Wobbegong a bit of a stomachache, but. Uh, and uh, this was our last trip in the Indonesian archipelago, where we started out in Kupang. Kupang is the first point of entry into Asia when you come up from Australia. And uh, we, so we sent the boat uh, 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 ahead to go there and we met the boat there. We flew into Kupang and then we did this journey that you can see. And uh, I highly recommend this part of the world for people who love the ocean, love ocean conservation. Uh, you know, whale sharks are normally found very close to the surface. Here you see me swimming alongside this whale shark. Unfortunately, you can't see how hard I was kicking to stay in place for the photo, but I've never kicked so hard in my life. But this picture was taken at 38 meters. We found this whale shark, not a very big one, but he was down playing with, with a school of giant trevally at 38 meters. And um, luckily, my buddy was positioned on the other side of him, and we both kicked like hell to get that shot. And I've never had as little air left in my tanks as I had when I got up after this dive because I ran out of air completely, kicking at that depth. Um, the, the picture below is Raja Ampat, which some of you know. This is the when we in the Helma Heresy. Oh, by the way, on the right is the Banda Fort. I don't know how many of you know about Banda, but Banda has a very interesting history. Banda was traded by for Manhattan. And it was a pretty good trade for the guys that got Manhattan and not such a good trade for the guys that got Banda. But Banda was the place where, uh, B, where um, sorry, what is that nut I'm thinking of? Nutmeg. Um, nutmeg. Nutmeg originated in, in Banda and prior to refrigeration, nutmeg was the only way to preserve meat at sea. So battles were fought over Banda, over control of nutmeg. And that is a fort in Banda that was used to defend all the nutmeg that grew in Banda. You can see the trees behind the fort. Those are Some of those are nutmeg trees. And uh, Banda has a museum and it's, it's actually an interesting place. And the Banda Sea is some of the best scuba diving in the world, the sea around this area. Uh, a lot of it is part of, part of this is this 
an area called the Forgotten Islands. And they truly are the Forgotten Islands. There is, we didn't see another boat for six weeks. We were the only ones there. It was absolutely spectacular, as you can see. Anil, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I don't you know how much on. more. Yeah. Sorry, I, just, I was just talking off the top of my head, uh, looking at those pictures, memories coming back. But there's, no. there's a lot more, obviously. Yeah. yeah, absolutely perfect. And again, you've got a you've got a considerable archive. So thank you very much for digging out a few of the choicest pictures. Uh, really, really stunning. Um, I hope that's offered a bit of inspiration to everyone watching. Um, I'm going to ask some boring questions now about the practicalities of uh, yeah. of long distance voyaging. Um, well, actually, first of all, I'm just going to uh, go back to you, Jan, Eric. For your trip, how long did you prepare for it? Uh, I would say as long as it took to build. Uh, Adele. Uh, so I was crawling over charts for a couple of years and reading as much as I could, not just about voyages, but uh, also about general books about the country, about the people, about religion, culture, everything. And then historic vo voyages, of course. Uh, Anil was referring to that in the, what happened in the 19th century. Uh, trying to go around the polar regions and South Pacific. It was very interesting to read about Cook's explorations and so and try to do something similar and visit some of the areas. I think it, it enriched any journey, any voyage so much if you have some knowledge about it. So a few years of prep went into your into yeah. your journey. And, and then, of course, provisioning. We had an airplane coming out to us in Fiji, and we have a special Royal Air Force plane helping us to bring food to the Falklands when we were continuing to South Georgia. So it's not just getting knowledge and planning the route, but provisioning it is itself is quite a burden to take care of. Yeah, absolutely. I can imagine. And, and Neil, um, how about you? For when two Northwest passes transit, it's well, uh, I'm not embarrassed. Uh, I'm embarrassed to admit that I was not nearly as diligent as uh, Jan Eric. <laughs> we actually did no preparation other than buying some warm clothes. We decided to go do the Northwest Passage in March of 2014, and we left in July. Yeah. So, and uh, and the only thing I did before leaving was get the boat serviced to make sure we wouldn't have a breakdown, have the stabilizers serviced and the engine room serviced. And we bought a bunch of, uh, which I highly recommend to anybody going, a thing called the Mustang survival suit, which uh, is what the special forces use when they go to the extreme climates. But it's absolutely essential for Arctic and Antarctic uh, weather. And we managed to find, they're very expensive, but we found them on eBay. For uh, because once you use them, you have not, no use for them. So people put them on eBay, and we found twenty of those in all different sizes for a fraction of what new ones cost, and they were practically new. They'd only been used once, and that's what we did. We bought those, and we set off going north, and we read all our books and learned what we had to learn along the way. Did what yeah. we had to do. Two distinct <laughs> was, uh, approaches there. <laughs> yeah, it was a real cowboy approach to a very dangerous mission, actually. <laughs> With a non ice boat, I might add. <laughs> yeah. So. Tough boat, though. Tough boat. Well built. Um, boat. Yeah, Eric, boat. Um, you mentioned tenders. How important is tender selection on these journeys? Presumably incredibly important. And what is your recommendation for support boats uh, yeah. when you're doing such extensive passage making? Yeah, I said that already in the presentation that uh, the more tenders, the better, I think. Uh, things can happen. And uh, uh, you, when you leave uh, the mothership, when we left Adele, we still wanted at least one tender to remain with a remaining crew in case something happened. You need to hoist the anchor or you need to get some deliveries or someone is coming from the shore and wants something. So uh, we had three tenders and not everyone can have that, of course, but, but the more, the better. And all of them had a diesel engine. Uh, you solved the problem, Anil, by having a support ship sometimes so yeah. that you could carry the gasoline uh, on that. But I think for um, the type of cruising we did to have a diesel 
engine, so we didn't carry any gasoline at all. Yeah, yeah that's then, an interesting safety point. So, Neil, you got around that by, uh, well, by chasing you know, the gasoline. So in Indonesia, that's what we did. We had a support boat carrying the because. Uh, latitude isn't big enough to carry a, a decent sized tender. It has. We have two tenders on board, mm -hmm. but for what we were, if if we had had a tender like what Jan, Jan Eric showed in in his pictures, we would have been eaten by a polar bear, because <laughs> we, because the he a big male polar bear swam out to us and tried to climb on to the big tender. We towed we towed a forty foot tender behind us, and without that tender, we would have been dead. We, or, or we wouldn't have been able to do the things we did. If we didn't have that tender, I think the trip would have been a good trip. Because of that tender, it was an amazing trip. Because that big tender that was not easy to tow, but we towed it for 20,000 miles, that made it possible for us to go up rivers, up fjords, looking for wildlife, looking for musk ox, for arctic foxes, for polar bears. I think if we didn't have that tender, we would have seen maybe four polar bears. Because of that tender, we saw 43. So a good tender for a trip like that, I, there's no point doing a trip like that with, without a good tender. And yeah. despite that good tender, we had a polar bear trying to climb on board to see if you could get one of us for lunch. So they're, mm. they're very aggressive. Yeah, unsuccessful. Um, obviously, uh, on such long trips, crew management is really important. Your relationship with your captain and crew are crucial. Um, yeah, Eric, I think you told me that you started out with most of the crew that you, you sorry, rather you ended the trip with most of the crew you started with, which is no mean feat uh, to maintain such good relations along that journey. So how did you do it? So how did you make sure your crew was well managed and how did you maintain that, that yeah. relationship? For us, I, I don't think it was really a, a problem because we offered such an interesting plan. We already knew when we hired the crew that we are going for a two-year sail, not around the world exactly, but we are doing a lot of amazing places by both Antarctica and the, uh, up into the pack ice in north of Svalbard. And lots of people were interested in joining that. So out of the eight crew that I shook hands with when they started the voyage, seven of them were still on board when uh, we left two years later. And so, Anil, would you, it's, it's about getting the crew invested in the journey, the, why you're doing it and excited about it all. Uh, the, crew, the crew were having so much fun. I mean, there was, they were absolutely delighted, Stuart, to be on board with us and not serving champagne and canopies in the med, which is what they would have been doing otherwise. So uh, we had absolutely no trouble with the crew. We had a great crew. They became really part of the family, practically. They all became really good friends. And we all we did all the recreational stuff together. We didn't just leave them on board. When we, when we went hiking, we took them hiking. We just left what we needed to leave, the minimum number of people on board to look after the boat. But we all did all the you know, the hiking, the wildlife, photography, the droning. We did it together with the crew. So we were 10 guests and 10 crew. And uh, usually when we got off the boat, we were at least 14 or 15 or 16 of us that went uh, and did everything. So there was no crew management to be done. They were just like, uh, they were amazing. The great attitude. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was less of an upstairs, downstairs thing. It was about involving them in the journey and getting, you know, okay. activities yeah. with them. Yeah. It isn't any upstairs, downstairs on a voyage like that because it's quite tough and it's long time and it doesn't yeah. work if you have a separation on a yacht. A yacht, yeah. a large yacht is a fairly small thing to live on board and you either become a team or you fail totally to work together. And that letter is a disaster, of course, if that would happen. Yeah, what I mean, we did barbecues on we did barbecues on deck where we all ate together, the crew and the guests. We all barbecued together and stuff, as you saw in that one picture, uh, and it was it was fantastic. So you, you both mentioned some hairy moments, and Neil, you you almost getting eaten by a polar bear, and then Eric, you basically sailed in a hurricane for a week. I mean, yeah, what, yeah. what were the really challenging parts of? your journeys, Jan Eric, was it the hurricane? Was that your memory of the most challenging part? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, uh, sailing wise it was, but we none of us were ever 
afraid or worried. I mean, it was tough uh, in, in, in the sense that food tend to slide around and so but uh, we, we had a problem when we couldn't get down the mission uh, one time before cape horn and we had to hoist people and it, doing that in hurricane wind you know you are going from one side of a boat to another hanging there in a line from the mission mass top in this case um, other than that we we didn't have any uh, I didn't have any experiences of polar bears that were threatening. I had walruses swimming up, but they were very friendly and curious. And uh, uh, so we, we didn't have any boring experiences like that. And Neil, apart from your, your encounter, your brush with the polar bear, was it was any But yeah, I, I didn't mean to suggest it was a worrying encounter. It was actually, I got my best photograph of a polar bear on that occasion. Yeah. We were never in any danger of our, we never felt in any danger, but he just came very close and he was circling the boat to see if there was a way, you know, he could get a grip on, on something. So the trick was to always turn the bow towards him because the bow is a high part and he can't, he can't get in. But it was a great photo op, obviously. Uh, but to, to me, the, the, the only two worrying things were we went out in the tender to, to uh, to scout out an area that we would have to go with the big boat. And it was a pretty dicey area. And when we went, it was completely clear. So we turned around to come back to tell the big boat, it's OK, we can go. And pack ice had come in, and we couldn't get back to the boat. And we were, uh, we were stuck for about seven hours, not able to go anywhere, just on the tender. But wow. the, the, the Canadian police had told us that even if you leave the tender for what you think is going to be a 20 minute trip pack as if you're going overnight mm. so take blankets take food take water so we were very well equipped we had chocolate bars and all kinds of stuff with us there was, no, there was no one coming to your aid if you got into big trouble yeah, I mean, you were on your own well, ultimately of course the canadian coast guard would, would come if we couldn't get out of it but it was a matter of waiting for the tides so what happened the same tides that brought the ice in after seven hours the same tides took the ice away and we got back to the boat. But of course, while we were there, there were polar bears walking around and we were just in the tender and there was ice around us. It wasn't water anymore. So that was worrisome. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing, of course, was that nothing to do with the Arctic. You know about that. Between Dublin and London, we got hit by what is known as a rogue wave and it almost tipped the boat over. Wow. The, 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 the large sofa in my main salon the sofa on the starboard side ended up on top of the sofa on the port side. I was thrown across a king size bed from one side of the bed in onto the floor on the other side. It's My incredible desk, to the Northwest Passage twice, and the most dangerous yeah. bit of the journey is in the Irish Sea. It makes no sense. The Irish sea, yeah. <laughs> exactly. My desk, which was screwed in the floor in the study in my study, the, the screws came out of there. Uh, the, you know, the, came out of the wood and the desk fell over. That's how hard we got hit. And uh, But during the Arctic passages, there was never any time when we felt in danger of our lives or anything. We, you know, we got stuck a few times. There was a few hours delay, basically. You just waited until the ice moved. So if we could, um, if as everything you both know now about you, what you did, if you could talk to 2014 and Neil in 2004, yeah, and Eric, what would, would what would you say to them before you before they set out on their journeys? What did you learn? What knowledge would you would you impart? Yeah, and Eric, perhaps you first. Oh, um, uh, yeah, I I would stress from my experience it's the planning part, but after having heard Anil, <laughs> I'm not sure that's needed any longer. Yeah. <laughs> But I found that uh, it, it was very valuable to uh, to do the planning correctly. And there are certain things in equipping the yacht. Uh, nowadays, if I built the same sailing yacht uh, more than uh, yeah, 15 years later, I would equip her slightly differently. Roller furling, uh, I didn't trust that for the type of voyage I did. But I probably would today. And I would have... Uh, the standing rigging would be carbon fiber instead of stainless steel on it. Uh, we had um, 
a problem with a diesel, the day tank. I would have a heated day tank today when we go into the Antarctic. We didn't have any problems in Svalbard with that, but but going south into Antarctica, we um, wanted uh, we we should have had heated diesel so that it would flow easier and we were worried that it would clog up uh, due to temperature problems uh, that's a small thing i would definitely have a couple of drones that anil yeah. had that didn't exist on my time and i as a photographer i really think that you have done some stunning image is for, uh, f uh, through the drone anil and uh, yeah. I would the, drone, the drones, Jan Eric, is a game changer. Really, it puts a whole new dimension on the ability of uh, taking amazing photographs. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, if you ask for a wish list, uh, Stuart, for a wish list, I'd, I would love to have an ice class boat with a submarine and a helicopter. But that, that's what I would advise anybody that can afford it. But uh, otherwise, uh, you know, my boat latitude gave did everything we wanted it to do. Um, mm. uh, I didn't. The only thing, like I said, we had to tow a tender. You need you need to have good tender support. That's yeah. the most critical thing. And yeah. you need to have dry suits and yeah. Mustang survival suits. Those yeah. two. God forbid, if your propeller gets damaged, so you have to go in the water to fix something, you better have a dry suit. Because mm. otherwise, um, you're gone. Yeah, so, we, we have the same, both survival suits and the dry suits as well as suits, of course. Yeah, so I found it really interesting, Yannick, when you're talking about the saloons and having different. So when you're traveling with guests, it's important to have lots of different breakout areas, effectively, because if you if everyone's just congregating in the same saloon night after night, it can get a bit tedious. Is that right? And also, um, I found it interesting your comment about uh, freezers when we were talking earlier. You'd have bigger freezers next time round. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I think. Uh, even if you plan for the crew and equipment like that, you, you, uh, I would not only have bigger freezes and uh, fridges, but I would have a larger laundry room. Uh, that's uh, definitely so. We enlarged it when we planned Adele, but I would have, should have, uh, today I would make it even larger. I wouldn't add anything in the guest areas, but I would add a laundry room and more fridge freezers. Yeah, that you can never have enough. So no. we had a we, latitude has a jacuzzi up on the sun deck. So we just emptied out the jacuzzi and filled it up with fruit and vegetables and covered it with a piece of canvas. And it was a natural freezer. And yeah, that yeah. gave us veggies for a long, long time. Yeah. But if we could have a, a nice walk in cold room or freezer, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We, we yeah. installed extra freezers uh, in the keel, so underneath. But, uh, uh, of course, on Adele, you have seen her, it's not possible to have full height. So you have to crawl down there, really, to get it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you both. Uh, lots of uh, wisdom there for anyone watching who uh, is thinking about taking on a similar journey. We have a few questions uh, been asked. A lot, a lot of comments about the pictures, gents. Uh, a lot of lovely things being said about your pictures. So there you go. Um, congratulations. So we have a question here. Were you ever, I think you might have answered this one in a, some way already. Uh, would, were you ever in an emergency situation? And if yes, how did you handle it? Yeah, Eric, that one was for you. Yeah, I, um, as I said, uh, we had a situation where the mission didn't come down and uh, we had to hoist in a hurricane wind. Uh, we had to hoist the crew member. And first we hoisted a guy and he was slammed so hard into the mast that we had to take him down. And uh, then we hoisted the girl and she was much tougher and she ended up <laughs> marrying the, the first mate uh, on board and they are still happily married. And, no. <laughs> uh, but she is a tough girl. Uh, uh, we, I was quite worried and I... Uh, she came down and uh, said to me after the whole thing, Jan Erik, I hope you got some pictures of me. And I said, <laughs> I, I was worried that something would happen to you. I didn't think of a camera. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's your first instinct. Mm, no, no, it isn't. 
Um, Anil, uh, I'll direct this one at you. Do you have any? Did you have any specific specialized crew on board with you to negotiate some of the more tricky passages? Uh, for instance, in the Northwest Passage or Svalbard. So the first time we did the Northwest Passage, we uh, recruited uh, Patrick Toomey. Patrick Toomey is the author of the original book written on ice navigation. He was a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. He's done the Northwest Passage 33 times and is the expert. On, uh, so we actually, he was with us as an ice pilot. Uh, but he, uh, it turned out that if we had listened to him, we wouldn't have done the Northwest Passage because all through the journey, all he told was telling us was, you got to turn around and go back. It's too much ice this year. This is not a good year to do it. You got to go back. And I said, listen, going back is not an option. That's why you're here. You know, if, if I was to go back, I don't need you to tell me to go back. I could go back all by myself. So you got to get us through this. And so he did. So, uh, yeah. So first time we did an ice pilot. The following year, we just didn't have that much ice. I'm sorry to say. I was very sad to see. Just one year later, um, there's, a, there's a stretch uh, called the Bellet Strait before Cambridge Bay. In 2014, 22 miles of the Bellet Strait took us 28 hours to do. And in 2015, just one year later, the same week, in August, that we were there in 2014, we were jet skiing in the Del Bellet Strait with no ice. So wow. it was quite sad to see. Yeah. Yeah, that's a stark contrast. And we had polar bears. We saw polar bears climbing the cliffs to eat the eggs from the nests of oh. nesting birds because they couldn't get seals. It's a very sad thing to see because they're risking their lives. They, they, sometimes they fall off those cliffs and die. And we, I've got pictures of polar bears uh, climbing cliffs, rocky cliffs, just to get some eggs to get protein, because they can't uh, they can't catch the seals. So their plight is actually very very serious. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it really is. Um, another question: uh, Neither of you went round uh, the Cape of Good Hope on your journeys, um, so I'm not sure. Uh, Either you can answer the question about how safe it is to cruise around Cape Town, but why don't we move it over to the other Cape, Cape Horn. Yenner, what was it like cruising around Cape Horn? Yeah, Cape Horn itself was nearly a disappointment because after this week of hurricane winds, the wind died down. Of course, the sea didn't. Uh, it's, it's always uh, very big seas uh, around there because they are pushed between Antarctica comes north and South America goes south and then everything is squeezed in. And so uh, it, it's rough from that point of view, but otherwise uh, it, it was not much wind. And uh, uh, so and it, coming sailing up to Ushuaia was absolutely beautiful afterwards when you came around. But, uh, uh, the Cape, uh, so it was a very interesting sailing, uh, attractive, uh, but before that it was rough. Yeah, but uh, of all the cruising highlights of kind of like tick box boating moments, Cape Horn has got to be right up there. I mean, what an yeah, adventure. Yeah. yeah, it is, but I would say Antarctica to both my wife and me, uh, both for the wildlife and the ice, it was so remote. Uh, I, I'm, uh, maybe the Northwest Passage that Anil has made can compete with that, but Antarctica was really stunning. And also, of course, the very remote islands uh, that I did, not with Adele, but uh, in Indonesia, just like Anil is saying, uh, that is absolutely stunning. Stunning, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have time for one more. We'll squeeze one last question in. Uh, would you uh, have you considered, or would you consider Patagonia and Antarctica a Neil? Um, absolutely. I mean, I, I would love to do Patag Patagonia and Antarctica, but I'm not sure latitude is uh, is the right boat to undertake that crossing from the tip of South America over to Antarctica. Uh, that's about as rough as it gets, and I like to be on board for the entire journey. But we we have talked about it and. Uh, who knows? One day we might do it. I'd love to do it. Yeah. 
I went. I went north first. I went north first because my main interest was to photograph polar bears and the plight of polar bears. Whereas, uh, but I also would love to photograph king penguins because I think they are incredibly photogenic, as you saw in Jean Eric's uh, photos. But uh, yeah, it would, I think it would be magic about if we, one could do that. Then one has basically done the bucket list. That's it. Yeah. There's nothing else to do. Time to put the for sale sign on latitude after that. <laughs> well, I was going to say, or, or commission the ice class explorer, Anil. Yes, yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I w we're going to have to draw a close. Thank you very much to everybody uh, watching, Anil and Jan Eric. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm sure everyone watching will agree, and everyone who's watching this uh, on demand later will appreciate your insights into what it's like to do such amazing passage making um i do have a few closing remarks um uh we will be uh yeah sorry the feedback that you'll be sent a feedback form and there'll be an opportunity to uh, provide feedback about the session uh following this so please do that please uh be your candid in your opinions because the more you feedback the more we can improve these sessions um Jan Eric's book, his inspirational and very well put together and produced hardback book is available. If anyone would like a copy of that, to buy a copy of that, uh, you can email me and I can facilitate. Remember my email was at the start, but just as a reminder, it's stuart.campbell at boatinternationalmedia.com. Drop me an email and, and I can help you make arrangements. Uh, last but not least, we have one uh, other online event next week uh, where Caroline White, Deputy Editor of Boaters National, will be discussing the post-COVID charter market. Uh, make sure to register and check out that. Um, that's it from me. Uh, thank you very much for watching and an extra special thanks once again to you, Anil, and you, Jan Eric. I uh, really thank appreciate you. it. Right. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody, thank you. We'll see you next time.